thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Fortuna. Um, I'm here to present rhyming with hacks. But let's set expectations right. I'm not singing today. Sorry, I'm not hip hopping. But as a compensation, um, I'll have written a poem that you can follow along through some of the slides. And hopefully that will compensate. Uh, but later today in the, in the social, if you buy me a couple of beers, maybe I'll, I'll sing. Uh, let's see. All right, about me, uh, I've been working with security for the last 15 years. I started more in the systems and network security side. Then very early on, I moved to bot detection. I worked in a few stuff. And uh, more or less 10 years ago, I moved into the client side security space, application security, code protection, and everything surrounding the browser and JavaScript security. So the agenda for today, I'm covering supply chain attacks. Um, I'll cover the basics. Um, then we'll follow through uh, existing solutions or approaches to solve uh, web-based supply chain attacks. Then I'll cover uh, the approach I've been working on uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. And we'll conclude. We'll have a, a couple of demos as well. So let's start with supply chain attacks. So in the context of this talk, because we, we only have 30 minutes, I'm sticking to web-based uh, supply chain attacks. It refers to mostly to third-party JavaScript that some way, somehow, got compromised and now is injecting arbitrary codes in the same context as your client-side code. Um, we could also refer or talk about compromised repos or compromised NPM packages. We don't have time for that today. So the context is web-based supply chain attacks. So like I said, compromise integrity of the, of the client-side code, it means arbitrary code execution. Um, some examples of uh, third-party scripts that usually get compromised uh, are analytics, ads, customer support, uh, plugins, live chat bots, um, this, there are uh, a whole uh, plethora of different uh, browser vendor plugins that uh, are getting compromised in the last couple of years. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And the consequences uh, usually are data leakage. Um, they usually insert what is called a web scheming or credit card scheming. They start leaking data and credit card information. They can also leak credentials. They can do things like crypto mining. Uh, usually, it's around uh, these consequences. So how, it, how does it work? Uh, so you have considered the first party codes. You might have some script in, scripts included in there. And those scripts are uh, loaded from third party vendors directly. Uh, you can have an iframe. You can load uh, HTML. From that HTML, you can load additional code. So there's second level and third level JavaScript uh, potentially being loaded. And, uh, and also, JavaScript can pull additional JavaScript. So uh, the level of uh, dynamics uh, it can, can be huge. So you have to account for, for this type of attacks. When something in this chain gets compromised, potentially your first party code and application gets compromised as well. Um, and what happens is uh, they uh, scrape the data they want to leak, and then they, they just send it to a drop server, uh, usually in the third party domain. So it's um, usually cross origin. But uh, one thing that uh, is certainly possible is uh, because they, they compromised a third party server, they might as well just uh, use that third party server to exfiltrate data to uh, as. In, on their way to exfiltrate it to a server controlled uh, by the attacker. That potentially can be any domain. The, the biggest difference is that um, usually the, the vendor domain is already whitelisted, because it's very common for people to just use CSP uh, version 1 using white-based uh, uh, domain um, blacklisting. I'll talk about it in a second. The motivation for these attacks are, um, 
are easy to understand. It scales uh, because they compromise the vendor, and immediately they compromise every website that is linking directly to that vendor. And with that, all the users that are visiting those websites. Uh, as a counterexample, consider, for instance, uh, reflected XSS. Uh, when you find such vulnerability, you still have to somehow uh, fool someone into using that uh, crafted URL. And, and still, you are only attacking one person. So it's a lot of effort compared with supply chain attacks, where everyone basically is executing arbitrary JavaScript at the same time. Um, it's also about because of the weakest link uh, are usually the third parties. So you consider big companies having uh, security departments. And sometimes they use third parties that are small companies with a, with a huge lack of resources, uh, probably just one or two guys handling all the security. So it's hard for them to cover all the angles. And it becomes um, uh, very attractive to attackers. Uh, these attacks are also known as Magecart. Uh, Magecart, um, well, we think that Magecart comes from either magazine, which is uh, the Russian word for uh, store, uh, or because most of the attacks, uh, or a, a huge chunk of those attacks, are um, Magento installations that are compromised. And so Magecart might be based on that as well. Uh, so it started with a simple, uh, single group back in 2015. Uh, and right now, we have uh, dozens of different uh, uh, groups just following slightly different approaches with slightly different uh, schemers. And it kept evolving. And since last year, uh, the sophistication of these attacks uh, have been uh, growing a lot. Um, what they do is, they, as I said, they, they perform digital credit card scheming. Um, some, some people call this form jacking, uh, although there's not a consensus about the, what terms uh, should be used. And they do this because there's a whole economy behind this. Uh, so they, once they, they, they scheme the credit card data, the, they have elaborate ways of just purchasing products. Um, and then uh, either um, they usually reship the products to their countries, the, the, the attackers' countries, and then they, they sell the, the products, or they just sell the credit card information uh, on the dark web. So we don't have time to cover uh, many of the attacks that have been going on uh, today. Um, so I'll just highlight a few of the attacks and what they have in particular, to, to my opinion. So it started with um, jQuery. Um, early on in 2014, uh, for a few hours they were infected. They were serving a, a rig exploit kit. Uh, that was not, probably not the first time, but uh, the first time it was really like visible to everyone in the community. Um, then uh, last year the Ticketmaster um, attack it lasted for five months. Five months uh, exfiltrating uh, credit card information without being uh, mitigated. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's concerning. Uh, the British Airways was also very referred. Um, and in, it's different from the previous ones, because in that case, it wasn't a third party that got compromised, but rather the first party code. So they were able to bridge into the network of uh, British Airways and compromise the code directly on the server. Uh, another example, uh, more recently this year, uh, Advert Line, um, which is an ad company, uh, was compromised. And what's particular about this attack is that their web schemer, the web schemer that was used in this attack, was very sophisticated compared with the previous versions. So it actually had anti-bot defenses. So there, if people are trying to see um, if uh, the schemer is doing certain things um, using like automated uh, mechanisms. They are trying to spot if such mechanisms are being used, and then they just prevent themselves from uh, executing in those moments, um, and therefore they avoid the, the problem of being detected. They also use integrity checks, so if the code is modified, they, they prevent themselves from, from executing, 
and, and uh, they check if the browser debugger is open, they check a lot of stuff, so uh, clearly the, sophisticating, the sophistication of uh, web schemers is uh, on the rise. Um, this month, uh, we had uh, also um, uh, a series of uh, supply chain attacks that compromised a few vendors. And um, so usually, historically, they only collect the fields from forms they care about. But now we started seeing a different behavior where they are basically collecting every form field they, f they find in, in the page. So um, it's just uh, an example to see how fast they are adapting and, and doing different stuffs. We also have um, examples of um, compromises that um, went after the, the, the crypto exchanges uh, keys. And, um, and yeah, so there's a lot of things that are going on. And unfortunately, we don't have time to, to go through all of this. So let me show you the anatomy of one attack. Uh, this is uh, the Inventa uh, web schemer. So Inventa was the vendor that got compromised in the Ticketmaster uh, breach uh, last year. Uh, this code is obviously obfuscated, but the obfuscation is very weak. So it's very easy to, uh, after a few minutes, to get uh, uh, nicely indented code that you can understand very quickly. And uh, so usually what it does is checks if the code is running in a certain URL that contains uh, these keywords like order or checkout or one step, then they just hook into um, a few elements that they can find in the page. You can see up there, uh, if, if, if they see a button or an input, they, they hook into those elements. They want to listen for, uh, they want to install the event listeners, like the click and on click. Then, um, they collect, uh, once uh, this function is triggered, they collect all the information uh, belonging to those elements. Uh, they replace the onSubmit event, uh, and they eventually they, they send this data to the drop server, and this code is executing every 30 milliseconds. All right, so it's pretty simple to understand. Uh, and now I have a demo um, of uh, one web-based uh, supply chain attack. It's actually an emulation, so it, this is a Ticketmaster website. Um, it's not the real uh, web schemer that is running. We actually implemented uh, a drop, our own drop server, and as you can see on the left, we are running this, and we are injecting directly the, the schema in the page using a uh, browser extension. So we are starting we are starting the, the drop server. So it's just waiting for uh, credit card information to be sent. And we are doing a purchase. So please bear with me. I actually accelerated the video a little bit, but uh, maybe not too much, so don't fall asleep. <laughs> OK. So this is what the user sees. It's just filling out the form and ordering tickets. And then at the very end, the code exfiltrates the data to the server. And you cannot possibly see that happening unless you're looking at your network settings or something like that. All right. So let's get into the existing solutions that uh, we see in the market. Uh, we, we cannot go very deeply into each, uh, every uh, solution, but uh, we'll cover the majority. But starting with the very quick fixes that you can implement. So the, probably the most efficient fix, at least uh, if you're concerned about third parties, is simply not including the third party in the pages uh, where you are handling sensitive information. So for instance, why would you need, I don't know, um, live chat in your payments page? Maybe you don't need it. So you can remove that live chat from that page and just leave that third party on different pages where you are not collecting credit card information. So another one, um, hosting the files yourself. Um, so some, some um, 
companies do this. Uh, the problem with, with this is, well, first parties can still be compromised. Uh, there are a few things that you can do, uh, but you are basically uh, assuming this responsibility. And, uh, and there's the problem of, being, of dragging behind in versions, because now the vendor cannot update the code uh, every time uh, he wants, which, if you ask me, it's a good thing. <laughs> But uh, they don't think so. So vendors usually don't like this. Um, you can also try to roll out like file integrity, um, read-only file systems. You can try to, to check if refresh the, the system every once in a while to make sure that uh, hasn't been tampered with. No one has been able to breach the server and modify the files on the disk. But uh, this type of solutions they, they get complicated very fast. You can also uh, consider using sub-resource integrity. Um, if, you don't, if you are not familiar with sub-resource integrity, it allows you to set uh, a checksum for, your, for the scripts being loaded using an attribute. Uh, the problem is, where I already mentioned, is that um, the third parties don't want you to do this. Uh, they simply don't want to lose the ability of updating uh, the, the, the file that you're using. And, and deal with the fact that uh, a lot of uh, their clients are dragging behind in, in versions. Uh, so they just force you to load the, the file uh, directly from their servers, and you either accept that or you don't. Um, so obviously, it doesn't cover the self-hosting. Uh, you, can, you, can, um, you can use sub-resource integrity with your own files, and probably you should. Uh, it's one way of... Um, uh, maybe mitigating the problem if your server was compromised. But, um, but surely, if they, can, uh, if, if they compromise the system, maybe they can just remove the text, and, and then they just, uh, everything just falls off. You can also do domain sinkholing. Uh, usually, this technique requires some sort of monitoring system using a server-side rendering. So every once in a while, uh, they start polling the website uh, and pulling out the, the data and, and, and code that, that is being executed. Uh, they execute that, that code. Uh, but then, at a certain point, the third party gets, or the website gets compromised uh, through a third party or something. And uh, what they do is they have, they have signatures uh, that try to match malicious content or malicious code. And if they detect malicious code, what they do is they simply update the DNS entry uh, because they, they find out what's the drop server domain, and they update that domain to uh, basically a null value. And uh, what happens is that um, everyone that's using that DNS information will not be able to, so the, the exfiltration will not work. Uh, but the problem with this approach is that there are a few problems, actually. Uh, the thing is, um, First, you need to ingest this threat intelligence information. So you, know, you either are consuming this information and, and get mitigation, or uh, it doesn't work. Uh, but there are a, a few other uh, problems. Uh, the whole approach is based on uh, signatures, uh, which means that um, they are looking for things. Um, and sometimes, uh, a lot of times, that fails, and that was the case with the British Airways. Uh, so the attackers, in that case, they changed the schema code, and the signatures failed to detect this in real time. So eventually, they noticed, but uh, they couldn't mitigate the attack. Uh, um, and, and the thing is, you cannot possibly predict how the web schemas are evolving and have uh, signatures that will always work, because they, the attackers can always obfuscate the code. Uh, in many different ways, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to work. You, obviously, you can, I already mentioned this, you can use uh, CSP, um, but the problem is that um, every solution I know is using first-generation CSP, so they are blacklisting uh, domains, and uh, that doesn't work because there are many bypasses. Uh, even Lucas uh, mentioned that in, in his talk uh, earlier today. And I actually have uh, a quote <laughs> from your research, Lucas. Um, <clears throat> and the problem with that is that, um, 
like I said, um, schemers can start using the third parties that are compromised, if not one of the many bypasses that uh, CSP version 1 has. So that CSP doesn't work to prevent exfiltration of data. This is a fair warning. Uh, so there are too many ways of accomplishing that. And so you should probably consider uh, other solutions as well. All right, so the last one is, um, is based on what I call JavaScript virtualization. Um, there are different solutions out there. Uh, this is my understanding of um, like the typical solution based uh, on this approach. So you need to use some sort of library, JavaScript virtualization library. That needs to run first. Um, and then what it does is it changes uh, some methods that are used to add code to the page, like the, the examples that you're seeing. So these uh, methods uh, become uh, proxied, and uh, this gives you a certain level of um, uh, security because, uh, uh, like I said, the, the assumption is that our library uh, has executed first. And so when you load the third-party lib, what happens is it will use one of the proxy uh, methods, and then what the library does is it runs that code in a sandbox iframe that is cross-origin. So hoping uh, for that to get some isolation and, and, and whatever malicious things the code is doing, it will do it in the sandbox environment. But uh, the thing is, uh, they need to screen the behavior of this uh, library because they, somehow they need to propagate what, what the library is doing to the main window. Otherwise, that, that code is not doing anything. Um, so they either allow the behavior or disallow the behavior. And um, if they allow the behavior, they, they will need to sync this behavior to the main window. And that's basically how it works. So the main problems I see with this is that the whole thing is super tricky to accomplish. Um, it needs to, it can break the application actually because it needs to, all the events that are synchronous need to be also synchronously propagated to the main window and that is impossible to do. So it has the potential of breaking the, the application or just creating um, racing conditions and this is to the best of my knowledge of course. Uh, also, it doesn't seem to be a, another way of doing it, but uh, by duplicating the, the DOM in the sandbox iframes. Um, so there, if we start digging, we'll find other problems. So in, in a nutshell, it's super tricky to accomplish. Uh, in my opinion, it can easily break the, the th third party uh, application. And also, it's a problem to know what's like uh, the normal behavior of the third party library. Uh, because that behavior can change over time, so it's hard to keep up. It's hard to know whether or not a new behavior should be allowed or not. So it's a very complex in general. All right, uh, so we are ready for uh, the, um, getting into the web page integrity. This is a new approach that we have been working on uh, in the last couple of years. Um, it's, it can be used to uh, try to mitigate uh, web-based supply chain attacks. Let me explain how it works. So on the client side, you have all these different elements. You have the DOM, you have JavaScript APIs, you have event handlers, you have first party and third party JavaScripts. But with web page integrity, you also have these extra JavaScripts that we call real time monitoring agents. Uh, so it doesn't look or monitor the first party or third party code. Uh, all it does is monitors the, the other elements. So as you can see, it's um, periodically looking to the DOM and all the other things uh, that you can see there. So, <clears throat> so it's based on mutation of servers and it has uh, a few checksumming techniques uh, built in and poisoning detection techniques. And it assumes that it's running in, a, in an environment where malicious code is running alongside of it. So once a first party or third party gets compromised, the, the first thing that you can do, it can go after the DOM by changing it, maybe modifying a form, 
maybe in certain elements, I don't know. Uh, the other thing is it can poison JavaScript native uh, functions or event handlers uh, to be able to, to scheme information out. It can also go after our codes, uh, but uh, that's difficult because it's uh, everything that we have out there is protected with tamper-resistant uh, polymorphic code. This is a big, this is a mouthful, <laughs> I guess, and I don't have time to explain it all, but it's basically obfuscated. Uh, it has tamper integrity checks, so it's checking if it has been modified, and from um, from request to request, the change, the, the code changes completely. So the, if the attacker tries to automate some attack against that code, it's, uh, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. So what we do once we detect something is off, we try to heal it, we try to annul it. So we, if we see some injection in the DOM, we try to remove that injection, if possible. And uh, if we see poisoning, we try to remove the poisoning and fix it, or prevent it in some cases. So it also has a server component, so we send this information back to the server, and uh, this information is then compared with historical data, and if we think that this is malicious, we send it to the back end of the application through a webhook. So this means that the application is continuously hearing a stream of events that are happening on the client side. And this is good because then you can set uh, additional reactions or policies on the, on the server side, and this is done in real time. So if you just hear that uh, anyone just tampered with the form, then obviously uh, we try to mitigate it, but if we can't, you can always like do uh, additional measures to try to deal with, it, with that. And you can adjust like the, what, what is happening on the client side based on that information. So we have uh, a second demo. Very quickly. So it's the whole thing again. Uh, so we are redoing the same demo, but now with, uh, with the agent is being included as well. So we start the, the drop server. Let me try to speed this up a little bit. OK. So this is the dashboard of the solution. So uh, it's currently empty. And now we are just purchasing tickets. Let me speed this up a little bit. All right, so you see, let me, for, you can see that something is happening in the back. So this is the, the dashboard again, and it just detected uh, some poisoning. And this is information that we, we detect, and we, we can show you the, basically the schema code uh, that was detected. A countermeasure could be uh, executed at this moment, but uh, in this demo, we are not doing that. And then at the very end, you will see that what happens with the, with the drop server. All right, so finishing the purchase, and it says form jacking mitigated. So basically, we prevented that uh, web schemer uh, from uh, successfully poisoning the form and we prevented the information from being mitigated. All right, to conclude, um, so web-based supply chain attacks, um, they usually go for the weakest link. Um, they usually find uh, like smaller vendors or enterprise with no uh, security in place or no real security in, in place uh, to be the weakest link. They scale. Um, this is a huge problem since last year. Uh, it's, I'm seeing a race in the market, so a lot of uh, companies are just rushing to get some, some kind of protection. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around uh, the solutions that you see out there and their effectiveness. And uh, I think this is a, a business problem, actually, because um, it, if, you, if your company ends up on the news um, but because uh, your customer's data uh, was somehow exfiltrated, uh, this is very concerning. Um, I don't think it's a very hard problem to solve, uh, so we, we should consider the solutions. And uh, we should also uh, consider that uh, schemers will evolve, will become more sophisticated and start doing like tampa detection, anti-bot and whatnot. And so in, the, in our approach, um, in my opinion, it's, um, 
there are benefit. There, there it's it's simple. It's efficient. Uh, you don't have to do the the whole thing of just marshalling the events to iframes. Um, it doesn't break the code because it's not changing anything about it. Uh, it's kind of holistic because um, it not only detects this kind of threats, but also can detect XSS and other types of um, tampering from malicious extensions, for, for instance. And uh, it has the, the also is all already protected with the JavaScript code protection. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying this is an invincible, nothing is, but it raises the bar a little bit and it makes it harder for the bad guys. So, in the end, it's always a arms race, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do anything. All right, so last but not least, I recommend uh, this white paper from Risk IQ inside MageCart. It's a pretty substantial uh, write up, it's, uh, I find it very interesting. And you have a couple other references that you can read uh, if you are interested in this topic. This is all I have. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if you are interested, grab the full poem using that link. <laughs>